Hello, I am so excited to moderate this panel on anonymous quilts because honestly, who doesn't love a good mystery? And we are so lucky because we have three of the celebrated six know-it-alls on here. And if you are not currently watching the wonderful programming, virtual program that the six know-it-alls are doing, well, you should be, I'm just telling you. So I served for 10 years on the board of the Quilt Alliance. And so I know firsthand how hard they work at their mission to document, preserve, and share the stories of quilts and their makers. And we are here today to talk about the makers, particularly the makers that are unknown at this point. And uh, honestly, sadly, that includes uh, the makers of a great many vintage and antique quilts. And so what do you do about those quilts? If you're a curator, if you're a collector, if you're an appraiser, if, if you're a dealer, what do you do about those quilts where you, you just don't know who made them and you don't know much about them? How do you label those quilts? Well, we are lucky to have such a great group of experts that can help walk us through the process of doing that. And I am so excited to tap into their wisdom. They are now each going to introduce themselves before we get into the panel discussion. And we are gonna start with Lynn Bassett. Thank you, Meg, and thank you, Amy, for the invitation to uh, to talk with you all today. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, just quickly to let people know about my background, I am a freelance museum curator specializing in historic costume and textiles. Um, I'm just going to focus on the quilts at this point. Uh, but a little bit about my background here. I was the curator of textiles and fine arts at Old Sturbridge Village, which is a living history museum that explores the 1830s in inland New England. And there I was responsible for a quilt exhibition called Northern Comfort, uh, which was a book published also by Rutledge Hill Press in 1998, if you want. So that was my first really deep experience with uh, getting to study quilts and particularly my love for old quilts. I went freelance in 2000 and in that experience, I've done a number of uh, quilt exhibitions, including one for Historic Deerfield and you might be able to catch the catalog for that uh, if you look online. And then I became the editor and kind of shepherd of the book project for the Massachusetts Quilt Documentation Project. And that was published in 2009. And of course, that was all about documenting quilts uh, across the state. And it was always so exciting to see one that we knew who made it and when and where exactly it came from. Uh, after that, I was uh, editor of Uncoverings, the journal of the American Quilt Study Group. And then I became involved in a traveling exhibition and book called Homefront and Battlefield, uh, which was a project with Madeline Shaw, where we looked at the history of the Civil War through quilts and other textiles instead of, you know, just the usual generals and battle strategy and that sort of thing. Uh, and another project I was quite proud of was being a contributing author to American Quilts in the Industrial Age from the American, or excuse me, from the International Quilt Museum. And that was a great project in taking quilts that may or may not have had some documentation and really pulling information out of them and in deep uh, sort of object studies uh, for each one. So you might look at that for, uh, you know, examples from all of the authors of how they look at a quilt that is documented or not. <clears throat> and then uh, I just wanted to mention this one because you can see this one online. This uh, quilt exhibition is available uh, in a virtual tour on the website of the Connecticut Historical Society. And the great thing about these quilts is that they were all documented. And then uh, my latest is uh, this project for the Florence Griswold Museum in, New in Old Lyme, Connecticut uh, about um, various forms of quilts and bed covers in the 18th and beginning of the 19th century, including these marvelous quilted petticoats. And so I, I end with this uh, petticoat that we see here from the uh, mid 18th century. 
and she signed it in the quilting, Abigail Trowbridge. And I'm delighted that I now have a, a book contract uh, to follow up on this project. And I have now discovered who Abigail Trowbridge was. And I am delighted to uh, pass you off now to my friend and colleague, uh, Alden O'Brien. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, we have been collaborating on things and passing each other uh, photographs and information about objects in each other's collections um, since her Sturbridge days. So we go back a long way. Um, I am at the DAR Museum in Washington, DC, which is the museum associated with the Daughters of the American Revolution. So we have about, uh, we have decorative arts, a whole lot of period rooms and so on. And among that is the quilts. We have about 320 quilts, um, quilt tops, both finished and unfinished. Um, and, you know, counterpanes, which is what we call the things that are one or two layers embroidered or pieced or appliqued, but not, in, not filled or quilted. Um, and they range from about 1760 or 70 to uh, the 1920s. We mostly don't collect much after about, about 1900, but a few of them um, do go there. Um, two of my recent exhibits are online. So here are the, um, the um, graphics from those introductory pages and uh, you can find them at these two places. And um, also, almost all the quilts, we just, we haven't updated the last very few um, acquisitions are on the quilt index. And also we now have almost all of our quilts except about 15 or 20 that just don't have very good photographs yet um, at collections.dar.org. So you can look those up. There's extensive family history when we know it. The great thing about most of our things being donated by the DAR members, um, or uh, quite often um, non-members, but th these are quilts that have been in the family for many years, is that the, the family history has come with that. So, you know, in a way we get to cheat. There's no label on the quilt, but we it may have come with history, which we can then research a little more deeply and sometimes debunk and sometimes say, oh, well, that's actually not the right uh, generation. It must've been a generation before or after, but that's a, a, big, um, uh, a big benefit of our collection. And um, and then I guess I'm supposed to wait to give my little lecture about uh, about this topic. So I'm going to stop sharing. And um, uh, I guess, oh, I meant to say my background is more originally clothing and fashion. Um, but that brings me uh, when I you know look at quilts, that means that I can often look at the the um, fabrics and say, oh, well, now that looks just like dress fabrics of the 1840s or 50s or a, a wrapper fabric from the 1870s. So Lynn and I both, you know, with our fashion history background, bring that um, into play as well as, of course, just a general knowledge of women's history and decorative arts history, um, which all play into looking at, at, at quilts that you may not know anything about you know, that's documented, but you can say, well, the aesthetic of this is very this decade or that decade. So there's a lot of sort of deeper background um, that that plays into this. And with that, I will um, mute myself and send you over to my friend and colleague, Julie Silver. Thanks, Alden. And uh, thanks to the Alliance and Amy for inviting us. Um, the three of us are good friends and uh, colleagues, and we work together quite a bit. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Well, like many of my friends and colleagues, I wear several different hats in this little quilt world of ours. And um, here you can see some of them. I've been a collector of antique and vintage quilts since 1966. Um, I've actually been a dealer since 1970, and here I have some very old photos um, of my partner, Linda Ruther, uh, with whom I had that shop, from Mary Strickler's quilt from 1972 to 1981. And in between, I was the quilt complex, but now I am Julie Silver Quilts as a dealer. Um, and since uh, 2022, I have this brick and mortar shop in Berkeley, California. Um, it's a delight. It was a surprise. And um, I'm uh, 
so happy to be able to be back in a shop and meet with people and so on. From 1982 to 1999, I was a official curator, um, meaning it was a, a, an ongoing job at Esprit de Corps, the uh, clothing uh, company in San Francisco. But I've also been a guest curator um, around the country and around the world, actually, um, and going into museums on my own with exhibitions that I have put together or exhibitions that I organize of their collections. I'm an appraiser, and in that capacity, I see lots and lots of quilts, and it's my job um, to document them as carefully as I can. Um, and uh, that's a, a big challenge sometimes and a lot of fun. I'm also an eternal student. Uh, I'm a member of the International Quilt Museum and other quilt museums and other museums. Um, I'm a proud member of the Quilt Alliance and uh, other organizations. American Quilt Study Group has been a very big part of my life since I was a charter member in 1980. And here I have learned an enormous amount about uh, quilts, antique and vintage and women's history in ways that um, many of you may know and those who don't know, look into it. It's a wonderful organization and I urge you to look into it. Quilt friends, lots of quilt friends through the years with whom I share lots of information and joy and um, entertainment. Um, and since 2020, um, I'm a member of the know-it-alls. There are six of us who got together to um, share what we know about quilts from several different angles. And two of my know-it-all colleagues are here with us today. I wanted to show just a few um, images of how quilts were documented in the past. We're gonna go into that in a bigger way soon, but here's a uh, name and date embroidered on the front. On the right, name and date cross-stitched on the back. Um, a very elegant and kind of quiet uh, signature of Joanna M. Dickinson in embroidery, her date, the date 1853. Um, she was a quiet, uh, kind of person. Sometimes it's much more elaborate and exuberant. Sarah, Sarah McElwain applicated her letters at the bottom of her album quilt to let us know that she had made it. And one of my favorite quilts in my collection is this one. Um, in these giant letters, Mary Lowcock has let us know that she made the quilt, the date she made the quilt, and where she lived. Um, we are thankful to Mary Lowcock and those who documented their quilts um, on the quilt itself. Um, so take this as a lesson as various ways that you might do that. This is a very famous quilt made by Elizabeth Holmes. And what she told us was this quilt was made 1869 by Elizabeth Holmes in her 68th year. And uh, 1869 was five years after the assassination of Lincoln. So what she is saying is Abraham Lincoln, and then below that Grant, President, Colfax, Vice President, which would be current to 1869, and the Union Forever, the Union Star. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, an outline of probably her hands, which are then stuffed. Here's a quilt in which the family uh, documented this quilt um, in the lower right-hand corner um, on fabric in ink, it says, Abby Leeming Forepaw, she is now dead. She cannot stir. Her lips are like the faded rose. Which of us next must follow her? The Lord Almighty only knows. Expired January 19th, 1842 in the morning. This was a six-year-old child who died and who was memorialized in this quilt. People tell us more or less, family members or researchers add things later. This was added in ink to the back of a quilt, lots of good information. This was added to the front of the quilt and is kind of a record of how the quilt came down to the current owner in 1881. Um, 
more recently, these two labels were pinned to the back of quilts that were owned, that are owned by Sandra McPherson, a collector here in California. And you can see that she gave us lots of information. Top piece by Charles Cater, African American, Oakland, 1985, quilted by Irene Bankhead, and so on and so forth. What she paid for it, who she got it from, and the date. And this one on the right has similar information, except added at the bottom, it says quilted April 92 by Freedom Quilting B. And someone has written with sore fingers, they said. The more we know, the better. And I'm giving a prize to Judy Matheson, who um, buys quilts, does repairs them or finishes them, and then tells us everything that we want to know, or many things that we want to know about her uh, what she's done, where she purchased it, that she finished it, and when. Um, and here she bought a top, 1880s, where she purchased it, from whom she purchased it, and the repair she did. She reduced the hill in the center, then quilted it, and tells us everything about it, its size, her name, the date, where she lived, and then when she moved, she put the second date. And last but not least, this is a top, uh, a quilt in progress by Susie Wright, who also gets a prize. On the back of the quilt is a label, and um, Susie goes all out. Um, in the ink, she not only does a beautiful drawing, which she is uh, uh, expert at, but tells us in detail um, what happened. She saw a quilt in, uh, in uh, many in 19 uh, many years ago she rem never left her mind she tried to reproduce it she figured out that the symbols were WCTU and tells us all about that and then says created with reproduction fabrics this recreation matches my memories in every way but size um, and the very last this is a uh, a calling card that was attached by thread to the back of a crazy quilt and in handwriting, Miss Adeline T. Miller wrote, this is not a crazy quilt. There is method in its madness, made in 1892. Um, various ways you can uh, document your quilt upon it. And we'll be talking about other, other ways of doing it as well and what to do when you don't know anything. So back to you. Okay, so uh, here we are. Um, I've got some questions for you and we're gonna have uh, some wonderful questions, I'm sure from the audience at the end. Uh, my first question is this. So let's pretend we're in an ideal world and you have gotten an old quilt uh, presented to you and you are really excited because you know there's a label on the back. And when you turn over that ideal quilt that you're so excited to read what's on the label, what would be on that label? Anybody jump in. Well, we start with uh, the name of the maker and, and what's really nice is if they actually say made by, because just because a name is on there, it doesn't mean that that person made it. They maybe made yep. it for somebody. Um, um, I would love to know date, place. Um, you guys jump in. I. I yeah, no name and you know date of birth of that person because sometimes uh, you, you know if you want to go on ancestry.com you don't know when that person was. I mean, hopefully the date of the quilt will help, but were they 16 when they made it? When they, were they 60 when they made it? It's going to be decades apart. Um, you want to know where to look for them. Um, was it made for somebody else? Um, I have an example of a couple of things. I, um, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, uh, these two have labels on the back, which say made for blah, blah in 1879 by his grandma, age 74. Well, that's great. But, you know, fortunately, these came down in the family. So I know who ML Key was. And I know that she was from the Eastern Shore of Maryland. If I hadn't known that, you know, this, this hexagon quilt gives me no regional clues whatsoever. So how would I have found who that was? John Baltzell Key, you know, would be a, a specific enough name that hopefully we could find him. Um, Martha Maddox, made by her grandma, Martha Harris, you know, it's just not quite enough um, information. You would like to have it be more specific. And the, you know, where, you know, tell me in what county and 
Maryland or Ohio or, or wherever that it is, so that when we want to flesh out information about these people, um, we have more to go on. Can I oh, go ahead, Julie? <laughs> uh, I just wanted to put in that I think I'm hoping that people uh, coming forward will put as much information as they can um, in all the kinds of things, including why this is for people working out, why they made it, where they made it, if they worked with somebody else, if it was meant for somebody else, how they felt about it. Um, as historians, um, just think about if uh, put yourself ahead a hundred years and that your quilt is go going to come down to somebody who wants to know about it. Tell them everything you want to tell them. Um, make sure if you can to specify what you actually know from what you uh, surmise or how you feel. Uh, I'm in favor of put as much as you can on your label for now. And it may not all fit, fit on a label. So then, you know, maybe you hope that it gets uh, written down and saved in, in some format uh, that gets saved with the quilt. And you just have to cross your fingers that people whose hands um, it comes into later will, will preserve that information. Well, we should talk at some point, or, or we should at least note that this information can now be kept electronically. And um, that's such an important thing that we probably won't talk much about today, but more information could go on a spreadsheet or some kind of um, and, and curators know how to how to do that and and collectors should learn how to do that. And Lynn, you had something you wanted to add. Well, if I could share my screen and show a so this is a, a great example of what you know, it kind of wraps up a number of things that we're talking about. We have the famous Anna Tools quilt. So uh, Anna Tools, her bed, bed quilt given to her by her mother in the year, and she even puts August 23rd, 1785 right there. So that is great documentation, but it doesn't get us over the finish line. Um, oh, how I wish she had said where she was. Uh, when she made this, because there's been so much controversy about this bed quilt. Uh, initially, because it was purchased in Maine, it was said to have originated in Maine. Now, as you're talking about with all the digital resources that are available, um, it's so much easier to do family histories. We can look up the Tools family name, and we find that there's a Tools family in Massachusetts, and there's even an Anna Tools. But is it the Anna Tools? Just because the name is the same does not mean that it's the right one. Yeah. And, and there are other things that you have to weigh when you're looking at this. What is the tradition in the 18th century for making quilts and who was making it and why were they making it? Well, they were made primarily, honestly, a special quilt like this. Uh, my diary research indicates that they were primarily made at um, at the time of going to housekeeping upon marriage. So that Anna Tools in Massachusetts wasn't getting married in 1785. So I think we still have questions about this. So anyway, I just bring that up as my example of, yeah, it looks really great, but ooh, if we just had a little more information. That's so fascinating because as a quilter myself, I just feel like if I put my name on it and who I who I gave it to and and you know and the date, um, that's you know seems to cover it. I just think you know I just don't think about when the people I gave it to are gone. Um, who's going to know? I mean, it just just doesn't occur to me. So I think that's really great to think forward like that. I, I'd like to ask, what do you call the pattern and and where did you get it? Is it your pattern? Did it come from a magazine? Did it come from a kit? Did it come from a whatever? Um, because you know the the idea of the diffusion of of those patterns and you know who knows how that may change in a hundred years. It'll be interesting. And now we we say, gosh, we wish those nineteenth century women had said what they call this pattern because there weren't a lot of pattern names. So maybe they didn't have a name for that pattern. But if they did, it would be nice to know what it was. And so there's you know there's there's that hole in our knowledge as well. 
So the ideal label would be a book. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's a well, lot. There's, there's a lot of stuff you want to know. If, if you if you put all that on, it takes all the fun out of it for us researchers. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, 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 there's give us a few crumbs. Give us a few crumbs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, give us a few crumbs. I agree. There's, there's plenty of quilts that uh, will be up to mystery. I think yeah, so. Yeah. Well, Lynn, Why you not? found out something that I wanted to get into a little deeper. And um, at this point, which is that there have apparently, there's trends in different decades and different centuries about how quilts are made. And there are also uh, trends in how quilts are labeled. So can you give us a little bit of, about that information? Oh. And well, I just happen to have a PowerPoint for you. <laughs> understood that I was supposed to do kind of a little brief survey of how quilts were marked. So uh, real quickly, I wanted to bring to your attention this fascinating book called Marking Time, which really introduces the subject of when and why people started marking their objects, their everyday objects with uh, names and dates. And this really became a practice in um, what's called the early modern period, um, basically the Renaissance when uh, clocks and watches uh, started to become uh, more available. It just made people more conscious about the passing of time. Uh, and, and it started this trend of marking things. And so we see, for instance, bed rugs of the 18th century are commonly marked with a date and initials of the maker. And you often see items marked in this way. This was made by Phoebe uh, Billings, but it's marked EPB. So that's Ebenezer, her husband, and then Phoebe, and then Billings. So that's how these monograms work. And Mary Foote was kind enough to put her whole name and the date on her bed rug. Uh, and then we talked about Anna Tools. Um, but then we get into the into the period of quilts. Bed rugs kind of fall out of fashion with the Industrial Revolution and textiles become so common and people start making quilts. And by this time, it's much less common for women to mark their bed covers with their name and date. Um, but we do still see some things. This is love and friendship within the heart and it actually has the date 1806 in it, but she didn't put her name. Lynn, Lynn uh, we go back for a second here. It yeah. might be worth noting for our audience that uh, quilts are sometimes uh, uh, dated and signed or inscribed in quilting and it can be difficult to see. So be sure to look very carefully at your quilt. If you have a way of putting the quilt in different lights, you might find something and surprise yourself. It certainly has happened to all of us. Well, great segue, Julie. Thank you very much. Um, because that's exactly what happened uh, with this quilt. When I was doing my research and studying the whole clock quilt, uh, I found this one in the Williamsburg Historical Society, and it was said to come from the Williams family, and that's all they knew about it. And it wasn't until I drew it, I realized that there was a name block up here. And what does it say? It says, Submit Gay, 1805. Well, then I got into the genealogy, and she married into the Williams family. So the history was correct, but they didn't know who made it because nobody had ever noticed that name block on there. And then <clears throat> similar sort of thing, um, LB 1803, um, this quilt, um, but um, at the time it was believed to have uh, been made in Deerfield, but little research and uh, turns out it's actually from Conway. So if you wanna read more about it, you can read about it in my magazine antiques article. <clears throat> okay, so then looking at um, cross stitch initials, cross stitching was a really um, common every day, really, a uh, universal way of marking household linens uh, into, much, into, into well into the 19th century. And so you see that on quilts every once in a while. And here is the, the thing that you have to watch out for. We have uh, Emmeline Ellery, 1821. And then notice that this is a different thread and all this sort of stuff. This is a later edition. Emmeline didn't do this. 
So that's the sort of thing you look for uh, on markings of quilts. Was it done by the maker? Was it added on later? Same thing here, Lucretia Reese, 1822. Um, the fabrics are consistent with 1822, but somebody added mock fat later. Um, and I have never been able to figure out exactly who Moffat is, uh, probably just a later owner. Uh, Clarissa Moore kindly stenciled her name and the date on her quilt. And then Nancy Newton, born February 16, 1801, uh, was embroidered on the center panel of this quilt which actually features a, a pocket uh, in the center. So I think that um, that was like a family heirloom that got uh, made into this quilt later. And then Julie, you know this quilt where uh, we've moved into the federal period and a federal Greek revival where white is the way to go with your uh, bed coverings. And so we see it here worked in the stuffed work. Similar here, it's so much easier to see if it's not just in a single line of quilting, but where it's actually full of batting, it's so much easier to see. And then this one uh, was like the, the, the queen mother of crazy quilts made by Senora and Payne May. I have to say, uh, you know, it's very appropriate that Payne is her middle name because this quilt uh, commemorates her four dead children. Yeah. And um, so she puts her birth and death, the birth and death dates of all four of her children. You can see in these blocks, um, there's one there, there's one there, there, and there. And then um, forgive my poor photo. She embroidered on the back, designed and made by Senora and Payne um, May. How many pieces and the year. And then uh, this is my last uh, quilt I wanted to share with you. And this, I will discuss it in greater depth in our next six know-it-alls program. But his, here's one that leaves us with a question as Alden was talking about, you can't always believe what you see on a quilt. Um, this was labeled by a later descendant, and he wrote down the names of everybody he wanted us to believe that these fabrics came from, including Martha Washington <laughs> and, and uh, his great-great-grandmother, which would put it back to almost, you know, 1700. There are no fabrics that are that old in this quilt. So you, you have to weigh the evidence of the object it, it's itself against the information that appears on it. So that's my overview of how quilts were marked in the 18th and 19th centuries. That is awesome. Well, this is what I want to ask you guys next is, you know, so we were talking about some ideal situations. We were talking about some quilts that have a lot of information provided in the labels in various ways. And it's, it's really fun and exciting to see that. But say you are given a quilt um, that is an old quilt and, and you don't know anything about it. You don't know who made it. You don't know all those things that you, that you do want to know. And so I just, you know, I think it's a very important question to ask what do you put on the label? I assume you don't leave it without a label. What do you put on the label? And also, is the information different if you are the collector versus a dealer versus a curator? Um, but what would what would you all put on? Uh, I, I try to put on on a label in that situation. I doubt. I'll leap in. I, I doubt it's very different for many of us. Uh, I mean, as a curator. Also, I'm not going to put it on a label on the back of the quilt. We have a paper folder still. We haven't completely left the paper world. And we also have our online uh, database. Um, you know, well, we have we have things online, but we also have a, a database that is in-house that has uh, information that doesn't make it to the public about, you know, appraised values and donors information and stuff like that. Uh, so we will put, uh, we can put more research and more information and, you know, conservation reports and anything that we need to about the history of the object that we've been able to find out before it came to us, 
or uh, treatment or, or information about the object while it's been with us. So we don't put all that on a label. So, um, so when we talk about labels, in my terms, I'm not talking literally about a label. Um, on, but, the other hand, on the other hand, I am talking about a label. Okay. Or, or at least a tag, as in my hat as a dealer, I need to give information to the potential buyers. And I do that on my website. When I'm selling a quilt on my website, I put information in the listing. But if I'm selling a quilt in my little shop here or at a show, I want a tag on that quilt that tells the people as much as I know. And mm -hmm. if I have more information, I offer to give them either an appraisal that I put together or just the information um, that they can have and take note of um, digitally. I think um, something that's important that maybe a lot of um, non-museum people don't know about is what we call provenance. It's the history of ownership of a piece. And I was thinking in my case, I have um, one quilt that I purchased and I bought it from a dealer in Bar Harbor, Maine. And she told me that she got it out of a trunk in an estate sale in Maine. Okay, that's not much to go on, but at least we know that quilt is from Maine. Um, yeah. So I need to get that on a label and sew it to the quilts. And yeah. I can say, I bought this in Bar Harbor in 2007. Lynn, Lynn, can I um, put in a word here? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> a, a dealer told you that, and I don't want to cast aspersions on dealers at all, but I think, wouldn't it be more accurate to say said to have been found in right. a domain? Because you don't right. know that for sure. Right, right. Yeah. According to dealer. Yeah. Right. right. I had a situation where uh, when we put up the Eye on Elegance exhibit, which is online and, and we have a catalog for it, this d information didn't make it into the catalog because we invited the donor. Um, I always try to invite re recent donors or donors that I can track down to the opening party to say, look, we're actually using your uh, quilt. It's not just sitting in, in storage. And she took me aside and said, you know, I didn't mention anything at the time when I donated that quilt, but I bought that at the estate sale of an African-American family who had been in that um, area for you know, many, many years. So, and they said it was a family quilt. So this is totally hearsay. This is 30 or 40 years after the fact that she bought this quilt. But that did not come with the original provenance. I have now added it to the record to say, according to the donor in an interview in da 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 year, blah blah blah. Can I say this is an African American quilt? I don't. I, I'm not quite able to say that with enough confidence. But it's an important thing that you know that little drop of information came my way, literally thirty or forty years after the thing was donated, and it's tantalizing but so you know take whatever scrap you can get but um I, i'm just throwing that out there there's no way you would have known that or been able to or that i could have found that out because it was just you know donor donated this she bought it that's all we knew you know i i've got an example of a quilt that came to me with no information that i was able to tease out some information in a way that was unusual and i'm wondering if this would be a good time to share that yeah yeah Yes, I did talk about this in one of the early know-it-all um, uh, presentations. Um, it's a quilt that I uh, bought many, many years ago when I had my first shop in the 1970s. And I was directed to an antique store by a, a fellow um, antique dealer who said, you got to go see this quilt. I've never seen anything like it. It was at a moving company um, who keeps things that don't get picked up. And I went and saw this quilt with my partner, Linda, and we opened it. We were blown away by, by the quilt on the left that ha is so powerful and suggests in such a major way that it's a morning quilt. But we said to the people in the store, what do you know about this quilt? And one yelled to the other, hey, Gladys, wasn't there a piece of paper with this quilt? And Gladys said, oh, I think somebody threw that away. Wow. So, um, heartbreakingly, we went 
Uh, we bought it anyway. And um, I was able to get a little bit of information. I'm going to do this as quickly as I can because uh, it's been many years. The first thing that happened was that I gave this talk at a guild and a, uh, one of the members' daughters was there and came up to me afterwards. I had described this as, an, as a um, calla lily. And this young woman who was visiting came up and said, I'm a biologist and I can tell by certain things about that flower that it's an, actually an alba lily. It's not a calla lily, it's an alba lily. I looked up alba lily and it only grows on the west coast of the United States. And while I bought this quilt in San Francisco, I did not know its origin and um, took that as a clue that it might have been made here, um, uh, either in California or, or, or Oregon. And then I was lucky enough to notice that in the border of the quilt, there was a, um, a label that said Taft and Penoyer guaranteed. And I looked up Taft and Penoyer and what do you know? Taft and Penoyer was a, um, a, a dry goods store in Oakland, California that existed from 1875 to 1928. And in 1928, it was purchased by another company called Capwells. So that piece of fabric must have been um, purchased at Taft and Penoyer in Oakland between 1875 and 1928. Um, and I won't go on with too much more here, but these are the kinds of things that if you look very carefully on your quilts and um, in certain kinds of ways, and in particular, if you share this kind of information as I did with the Nobodals and other quilt friends, um, people are able to sometimes give you information that you didn't have. Um, in this, Alden and Lynn um, come from costume and no things that I would never begin to know. So just as a quick example of some of the things that you might find out, those that setting that quilt on the West Coast during that time is something we didn't know before and would go on a label of mine. Oh, that's yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanna go on now. Um, and, and you know we are it's great we've been talking about uh historic pieces and pieces that come to museums and uh, uh and, all, and all of that um but i want to do something for um the people who are quilting now the people who are collecting now um and and get into the kind of the technical part of um what is your advice for um what they should be not just what they should be we've been really giving them a lot of good ideas of what information they should they should be you know putting on there for the future but what are the technical things what kind of fabrics and materials should they be using that will continue to last what kind of pens because you know we're not all we're not over here doing our, our little, you know, cross stitch, um, uh, you know, insignias. That's not happening now. So what, given that, you know, the tools that we have at our disposal now, what would you like to see people doing that you think will last? I'll well, I, can, I can say a few words about what I think people shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Um, ink smudges. And if people don't know how to use ink on fabric, um, this is what's going to happen. Um, it, um, oh my goodness, paper, paper attached to, um, to quilts, even when it's, uh, sewn on the quilt on the right looks like this label got, went through the wash. And so we don't have no idea what it says. The label on the left is wonderful. It's on a quilt top. Um, it has the, what is supposed to go on. I think Susan E. Benny, 1885, remember me when this you see, um, lest I should be forgotten, your friend. Um, but that's not a very, um, at all, a very good way to um, to label a quilt. And I'm wondering if you all have something else to say about that. Well, in the museum world, we use Pigma pens, which are available they're pretty generally available, but um, the um, museum sources tend to be like Gaylord or University Products, um, those sort of places. But I think a lot of quilt shops actually sell them now too. Um, it's an archival quality ink felt tip pen. You can get it in various um, fineness uh, qualities. And um, what I would do is 
write it out on on a piece of muslin and sew that to the back of your quilt. And supposedly that won't run or anything, but I'd probably be inclined to just take it off if I were to wash the quilt, which probably shouldn't be done anyway, because so many dyes will run and things will shrink irregularly and, you know, all of that kind of thing. That's a whole different topic, whether to wash your quilt. Don't put it in the washing machine, whatever you do, for God's sake. Um, <laughs> Kids, don't try this at home. Consult a <laughs> professional. Uh, and and can't, moving on. Can't this be um, typed on the computer and run, uh, printed onto fabric? I don't know much about how, technically absolutely, how that happens. Abs absolutely. You can buy these treated fabric sheets and you can write it on the computer and print it on there. And um, and then you also would have the advantage of, you know, a lot of you guys must be trained by now to decipher those script letters that are half faded. Cause I look at that and I can't make out what it says, but if you did it, you know, on your computer uh, so that so that you have a, a font, you, you know, you have something that is a little easier to read that can work. What, uh, do you disagree with that, Alden? Um, I would just say, I don't know what's, on what what substance is on those things i've mm -hmm. i've bought some of those things but in order to go through the computer they're adhered to some kind of paper i don't know what that adhesive is i think they're made so that you can iron it on to a quilt i have no idea what's in that stuff i don't know what it's going to do to the fabric underneath it or above it or the ink i don't know if it's washable mm -hmm. i don't know if it's going to destroy that fabric in 50 or 100 years Good point. I, ju I just, I would be cautious about it. I would That's rather say, I just... think some of it you can buy that does have adhesive, but I never get that kind. Um, okay. I, I get the kind, it has like a clear uh, plastic backing, but it's not, there's no uh, glue so you can glue it on. I, I sew it on, but you may, you know, mm -hmm. I think anything we do is you have to be cautious because who knows, you know, I mean, yeah in the next generation or or three generations after that, what shape is it gonna be in? And I think maybe yeah. one of the things this argues for, and you uh, all was talking about, talking about the, the bigger uh, curatorial aspect and the different ways that you document things on paper, on uh, databases. And so maybe this is an argument to say to people, how else can you document that? And, yeah. and, I, and I would suggest that if you're documenting it on paper or I mean digitally that you put on the label on the quilt some kind of number that refers to yeah. what, what you've put in the computer so that yeah. um, if people are trying to match it up later they know what. I'm also going to tell a slight horror story about a, uh, a, a collector of, of clothing who um, is a friend of mine. She suffered a very sudden stroke. She had an amazing collection um, she had a lot of records from both uh, dealers she had bought things from and stuff she'd bought on eBay. Uh, if it was from eBay and she had printed it out, she had, you know, there was a picture, but she had maybe 10 1780s white or off-white embroidered gentlemen's waistcoats. And to find a little thing from a dealer which said embroidered silk gentlemen's waistcoat 1780s and not know which of the 10 it belonged to was very frustrating for those of us who were trying to document uh, her collection and its provenance. So, you know, if, if you're a collector, um, keep, keep good records so you know what things are. And also, if you have it on your computer, give somebody the password. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Yeah, I've got a, a, a couple of points if I could. Um, if anybody has a good old fashioned typewriter still, some of the nice clearest labels that I have seen in my career have been typed. And yep. the very old we used fashioned to do that. Like, typed onto muslin. We used to do that. And stitched onto the piece. Yep. Um, and, then, the and then PS again, we remove that label if we're washing it. And then the other and thing that, it back on. that um, private collectors and makers might uh, pick up from the museum world is 
maybe putting a number on a quilt. I mean, they don't have to go through the, the exact system that museums do, but even starting at one, two, three, if you want to add additional information, then you want to put on a label, you could say quilt number one, give the, you know, give the basic information yeah. and then have a notebook or your database or something that you really flesh it out in so that you don't have, you know, this is my, my Lone Star quilt, da, 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 and you have five of them or whatever. Yeah. Yep. You can, you can exactly. Number one, number two, number three. Oh, preferably, preferably database, preferably database because um, pieces of paper and notebooks get lost. Oh, wow. So you, but this again, database you isn't, if you, yeah. You guys are giving me a lot of work to do, but you're making me realize that even though I don't have a huge collection of quilts, I should start taking this seriously. And so that leads me to my next question, which I think is going to be really fun. And I talked to Julie and Lynn about this just a little bit, Alden, uh, before. And I just, I think like a lot of people out there, I have some some textiles, some quilts that were either I acquired uh, uh, as a collector or they were given to me. And I know very little about them. And um, and I have started to have like waves of guilt. Like I would leave these behind and I, you know, the next person would know even less and then it would be gone. So I am going to share a couple of them and um, you're going to see photographs. This is uh, a quilt that um, I made, uh, I made, I bought for my mother. My mother taught me how to quilt in the late eighties. And she loved quilts. And I was um, a, a covering the business of the arts for the Wall Street Journal. And I was a regular reader of the Maine Antique Digest. And I saw this quilt for sale, this antique uh, Amish crib quilt in the Maine Antique Digest. And um, so I bought it for her. And um, I've just taken a picture of it so you can see it. I've carefully tucked over the part where um, there are um, uh, uh, candle wax uh, stains because my mother had it and my dad had it um, in, in, on the wall next to their uh, their dining room table for years and years and years. So she loved it. But, you know, my question is, okay, I want to label that now and carry that information forward, but I don't know that much. What is your advice? Uh, um, well, was it sold to you as an antique? Yes, that was what it said in the ad. And I don't recall, again, I wish I had that ad. Um, I didn't think it was the first quilt that I ever bought. So I didn't write any of that down. Well, I, uh, yeah, the first thing would be um, at the time of purchasing, get as much information as you can, obviously. And that goes on um, what the dealer tells you or, um, uh, or that you bought it at such and such a time from such and such a person. Um, in this case, uh, I happen to be an expert on Amish quilts, and I know, uh, so I guess the point is, ask somebody who knows if you can. Um, I happen to know that there. this is Lancaster County, this is uh, an Amish quilt made in Lancaster County, or after a quilt from Lancaster County, and in this case, I happen to know that in Lancaster County, they, they're they did not make crib quilts during the classic period of 1880 to about 1950. So this was made later, even if it was made from uh, older fabrics. And um, that just happens to be something that I know from my years and years and years as curator at Esprit and just studying Amish quilts. So if one thing you might do is look for the expert um, in the field of, you know, in the genre that you're looking at. And I could tell you that this was um, almost certainly made after 1980. Oh. <laughs> so okay. maybe at the time that I, that I bought it. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and there's more to that story, but um, I think the point is, if you know what, if you know something about the quilt and you can find an expert to check in with, that would be the thing to do. Oh, that is great. But I, I should still label it, right? Yes, indeed. Indeed. And, and now you can label it and say, Julie X, Julie Silber, former curator of the Esprit Collection of Amish Quilts and an expert on Amish quilts, has noted that it is X, Y, and Z. Yeah, that's great. Wow, I am so lucky. All right, so let's move to the next one. Um, this is a um, a sweet um, vintage quilt that I bought at AQSG seminar 
And um, I I love to buy quilts there at the at the auction. A lot of you people who are really knowledgeable and have wonderful collections. It might be a minor piece to you, but it is a treasure to me. And a lot of these pieces are very affordable. So this is also a plug for AQSG and going to seminar for everybody out there. But um, so it just had a little uh, tag on it. I think there's another picture that shows the tag. And that was on it. I don't know who donated it to, to the sale. Um, it, I, it probably cost me I don't know, 25 or $30 or something. Um, but that's what it says. Pine Tree Quilt, West Virginia Origins, 1930 with great grapes and leaves quilting and then the size. So um, I'm, what would you do? What would you, what would you uh, wanna put on a, on a label? And do I keep that on there? or just take a picture of it. I, I don't know, what's your advice? I think it's a good idea to take a picture of it and keep that as part of the record. Um, we talked about this before, and I think I suggested that in your own records, you would say said to have been made in West Virginia because we don't know that. Um, and um, let's see. Uh, oh, I think on a label, I would put that you bought it in an AQSG, American Post Study Group seminar, in what year? Um, I do think that usually at American Post Study Group, was it a silent auction, I think, they often have the name of the donor. And if they do have the name of the donor, make note of it, find that person, and see if they know any more than that about it. Yeah, I don't think in this, in this particular quilt, um, that was the case. I know there were some that uh, that I did buy at a different seminar from Sue Reich and you know other people where I was aware of the person, the collector who had donated it. But in this case, I, I don't know that information, but that is good. I was in a place where I could have maybe asked around. And um, so, so that is the kind of information that if you can get it in the moment, you should try. I'm just thinking that, you know, we're, we're showing our skepticism here that maybe we should tell our viewers what it takes for us to be more positive about where something is from because we kept on saying keep on saying said to be you know it's got a label on it, it says west virginia why are we so skeptical of that in this i don't know if we're specifically skeptical as much as because we're historians and we want to we want to be transparent about how much we know and what we're confident about we're hedging our bets it's not that we're questioning the veracity of the person who wrote that label or where they bought it or whatever we just don't absolutely know for sure and so we're kind of hedging our bets it's right. like when i write a, lo a label that says according to family history right. this was made by so-and-so or this was the wedding dress of so-and-so now maybe it's a uh, a dress that is that could have been a wedding dress because the date lines up i've been able to find the marriage record but we just we weren't there. We don't have a newspaper account saying the bride wore this particular dress. So it, it's a matter of hedging our bets rather than not believing somebody. I just want to throw that as, in. As, as I can tell you that as a dealer, what I like to do is say found in or origin unknown found in if I know where I bought it. Um, this idea that it's <clears throat> There's nothing about the quilt in the images that we've seen so far that would that would verify that it was West Virginia. But knowing that somebody said it was West Virginia, there might be more to be found. For example, maybe somebody would just accidentally find, maybe it's signed somewhere or a date somewhere on the quilt. And then if you know that it's West Virginia, we might be able to line up the name with uh, West Virginia or not. Yeah. So you right. me so which, which I, from what you were showing us earlier, is that I should just kind of get down on my hands and knees and really examine this just to make sure that there, there isn't any other uh, identifying information um, or bordered in or whatever. And I will, I will do that. That's also very good advice. Right. So I, my point, I was just trying to get us to talk about what it is we look for that, that we so, really um, can sink our teeth into and say, yes, this is the correct history. So um, I, I was just looking for um, for uh, you, you, me, whatever, to talk about um, documentation through family records or photographs or, you know, a, a stronger sort of oral history. 
or a regional, a regional um, yeah. characteristic. This quilt is so late, it's 1930s and it's a typical design, a, a, a classical design uh, pine tree, tree of life. There's nothing that says regional West Virginia or anything else. It's so late in the game. Um, but some of the early quilts, you really can see regional characteristics and um, that would help you um, in an earlier quilt that would help you set it. Wonderful. Can I um, can I do a screen share, uh, Meg? If you stop your sc screen share. Well, sharing. you know we're kind of running out of time. Oh, okay. Um, we're, yeah. We're, yeah. You may uh, be able to find regional things. You may be able yeah. to date things by you know if someone has a date range, you need to do some research on whether that style or pattern existed back then. Fabrics, um, fabrics. Fab and of course fabrics, Barbara Brackman's Clues in the Calico helps you with that. Um, there are other books and so on. Um, reading, uh, Lynn showed those, the book she contributed to, Quilts in the Industrial Age. There's a second volume, Quilts in the Machine Age, which takes it into the next century. Um, that shows many, many examples um, uh, in the Inter IQM, International Quilt Museum collection. You can compare with those. Uh, you know, it's not an easy fix. You know, it, it's not easy to just say, how am I going to look this up? I'm going to figure it out in half an hour of browsing right. online. Yeah, but again, you know, the more you read, the more you know, the more you learn about the style of of prints and the, the development of dyes and, and all of that. And that, you know, that's why it helps to ask a know-it-all, you know, ask an expert. Yeah, ask a know-it-all. Uh, <laughs> But which is not to say, you know, do your own research. It's just, you know, you're, it's going to be hard to acquire all the little nuances. Exactly. Um, exactly. And also, you know, you can go to a local, if you, if the know-it-alls are not available or at your service, you can go to a local appraiser who, who you know has a good reputation. Well, I want to get through a couple more here and then make sure we have lots of time for questions because I think those are going to be juicy. Um, this third one is, is a, uh, is a quilt that was given to me by a cousin who told me it was the oldest quilt in our family and that it was made by our great grandmother, uh, Missouri Valentine. And she uh, she was putting her mother in a nursing home and she was an, interested in quilts and she asked me if I wanted it. And of course I was just jumping up and down. I could hardly wait for the box to come and she didn't know how to describe it. So I open it, I, I see this beautiful quilt. I am so thrilled. And she said, you know, our great grandmother, Missouri Valentine made it. So I open the box and pinned to the back is this kind of brittle piece of paper. And on it was written by one of my mother's other sisters. Uh, our uh, grandmother had this made. And so I was, my, my heart stopped because I, here I was so excited that I was, you know, descended from this long line of, of quilters and, you know, and Missouri Valentine didn't make it. But um, we also have a picture of Missouri Valentine that was uh, taken in um, 1906, according to the information that I have. Um, I don't know anything about the date of when the quilt was was made um, for for her son. But so that is all the information I have. And you know what what would you all do with that? Well, thankfully that piece of paper was on there. Yep. <laughs> Otherwise, how would you have known, right? <laughs> And that's not an un unusual thing in the, <clears throat> especially in the early 20th century, to have a quilt made um, by uh, somebody else is is uh, pretty typical. Um, good, you know. And yeah, and that's that brings up another thing that a little bit back to said to have been. Um, without that paper, that's the history that would come down made by so and so. And of course, how much do we love the name Missouri Valentine? But um, <laughs> You know, sometimes people find something in the attic and we say, oh, this must have been made by so-and-so. And for whatever reason, they assign it to grandma. Maybe it's because it's in grandma's house. Well, maybe it dates to a different period. Maybe it was given to grandma, not made by grandma. We found a crib quilt in my mother's, uh, my grandfather's attic that we thought was, um, that my mother gave to me to put on the wall um, just for a year or two. And then it went into storage of my daughter's room when I had my first child and each child got you know about a year with it on the wall and then I put it away again. But um, she said, oh, my mother made this for me when I was a baby. Well, we put together some other clues, found another quilt that we learned was made not by my grandmother, but by her mother-in-law. And it made much more sense because 
my grandmother was not the quilting type. She was not a hands-on kind of person. And my only thought was, wow, she must have been under the power of, of some serious nesting hormones to make that quilt because she never made any quilts. But her mother-in-law made many quilts. So we just sort of found this initially and assumed, oh, it must have been made by X and it wasn't made by X. So, you know, family history gets confused. You know, it, it, you just have to take things with a grain of salt and, and dig a little deeper and say, is there someone else in the family history who's more likely to have made that? No, I just want to tell you, Meg, that that uh, photo is spot on for fashion in 1906. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. Yeah, Missouri Valentine. I, I love her anyway. Um, OK, so the last one that I want to share is um, is a quilt, um, fittingly enough, that I bought from Julie. And it's um, I don't need to show you a picture because it's right behind me. And it is this beautiful quilt. I was under the influence of cheddar because there was this wonderful uh, exhibition at the International Quilt Museum. And, um, and I just want um, Julie to give me advice. Um, she knew not a whole lot about it when I fell in love with it and, and bought it from her in Houston. And um, what, what would you add and what would you have me um, record for this one? Well, it's a wonderful thing to show because uh, we can talk about our colleague, Barbara Brackman's uh, Facebook page, which is called Quilt History South, <clears throat> which um, attempts to categorize what are the characteristics of Southern quilts um, in America. And this quilt has so many of those characteristics that um, we can, I think we can safely assume that, it, that it's a Southern quilt. Um, there are people who even know regionally where certain kinds of things show up. My gut here tells me, I'm not absolutely sure, but that it's North Carolina. Um, we'd, we'd have to check with people who know that, P Pepper Corey, Kathy Sullivan, other North Carolina people, or people who've studied um, Southern quilts in general. But it does have many characteristics, including the sashing with the intersection um, in solid color, um, the design itself, the 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 um, the color that I already say that, um, and a few other things that if you pay attention, I I encourage everybody to go to uh, Facebook and look at Quilt History South, and there's so much that we all have uncovered over the years about how to uh, standardize certain kinds of things that give us these clues. So what I can tell you is I'm pretty sure it's Southern. Um, and I don't, I can't say too much more than that, but uh, others may be able to. You guys have anything on that? Uh, I, I, I just yeah. immediately looked at it. And after, you know, following Barbara, I thought, oh, well, there's a Southern quilt. Right. Yep. <laughs> right. I've got, I, I have a slide with the checklist for Southern characteristics. If you'll um, let me share quickly, I'll just um, go to that slide if I can. Well, while you're um, finding that, let me just say that it would make me extremely happy if it was from North Carolina, because that's where my parents yep. retired and where my mother learned to quilt. Oh, um, so that would be cool. Lovely. That would actually be quite lovely. Okay, this is here's the, here's the checklist that that uh, Barbara has put together after um, many months of of hosting. Uh, this Facebook group where each week she'll say, okay, let's look at anything anyone has that is known to be from X state or believed to, strongly to be from X state or Y state, or now let's look at cheddar, now let's look at sashing, now let's look at this. And she's put together this checklist for seeing um, how many characteristics that we find are very strong indicators of, um, of Southern origin. And it doesn't definitively prove anything, but if you can tick off a whole bunch of different um, things on that list, um, it's it's a, a good start. And that image on that checklist shows just that exact sashing. That's um, right. So yeah. That's one of the strong indications. And what often is, it'll be a trip, double or triple sash. What is this pattern called, block pattern? Uh, I think it's a Rocky Road uh, variation I'm, I'm not I don't remember it's um I think it's called Rocky Road to Kansas or something like that it's very very I <clears throat> by the way this is a point where we might also uh talk about Barbara's book called the Encyclopedia of Peace Patterns yeah. and it's 
definitive. It, there's a new edition. It's wonderful. And um, it's a way to find the names of patterns organized in a way that my brain doesn't work, but most people's do. And um, you can find the name of any known pattern where, where it might have originated, if it's a kit or a published pattern. Um, Barbara Brackman, Encyclopedia of Pieced Quilt Patterns, Piece Patterns something like that. She also wrote a smaller book called The Encyclopedia of Applique Patterns. And those are uh, two books that are should be in every library of people who are interested in getting information about their quilt. Oh, absolutely. Well, I think we're going to have to wind down right now. I could go on with you guys forever because this <laughs> is so much fun and your knowledge is so deep, but I can't wait to hear what the questions are. So let's uh, open it up to questions now. <laughs> 